It is my great pleasure to introduce Jonathan Tanner. Uh, this is his second guest lecture with us. Uh, I'm hoping he's enjoying this. That is why he's coming back. Um, you guys have already heard him. Uh, Jonathan is currently a senior security researcher at Barracuda Networks. He started at Barracuda as an intern uh, while attending San Jose State University uh, after winning a hackathon organized by them. After graduating with a degree in computer science, Jonathan started working at Barracuda full-time as a software engineer and built their malware detection platform. Uh, after getting a good deal of exposure to various threats, uh, Jonathan became interested in cybersecurity research and uh, transitioned uh, into his current role. Jonathan's research interests lie in the areas of artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and software design and development. He enjoys participating in competitions and has won the coveted Black Badge twice at the DEF CON Wireless Capture the Flag competition. Uh, he has also won many other programming competitions. He's an expert commentator and has also authored several articles. Uh, I will provide you the link to his articles. Uh, his articles are in the area of IoT security, cybersecurity, malware, biohacking, and ransomware. Uh, all the good things. So please join me in welcoming Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, all yours. Uh, you can share your screen. And let's get started. Okay, so... Uh... The, about me, I mean, a lot of this has been said, but yeah, Senior Security Researcher at Barracuda Networks, uh, San Jose State Computer Science Program alumni. Uh, I'm addicted to physical security and lock sport videos, which don't really directly fall under what I do for work, but it's in the area of security and really interests me. Uh, I enjoy craft beer and long walks in the circle pit. Uh, I'm the husband of a talented metal bassist and the father of a future hacker. Uh, I built the backend system that provides our advanced threat protection uh, service at Barracuda Networks. Um, I also author blogs on various threats that we see. Uh, this was my first one that I did. Um, and I like to go to security conferences. And this was uh, from B-Side San Diego, which was my first uh, speaking engagement, uh, giving a talk there. I also go to Besides SF and DEF CON, which is online and free this year. So if anyone's interested in uh, learning some more about security, you can get in on that for free and not have to go anywhere. Um, I compete in the wireless CTF. Uh, I've done it four times at DEF CON and my teams have won twice. Uh, I didn't actually end up with a black badge because you only get one for the winning team, but we have won black badges as a team twice. Okay, so basic security precautions. Uh, make sure you have antivirus installed, preferably multiple. If you have Windows, Defender's already on there. So if you add something on top of it, like malware bytes or just anything free that is good, uh, that'll be sufficient because they all use signatures to detect malware. So you want to make sure that there's uh, no missing gaps or as few gaps in their signatures. And also it kind of, I think, would depend too on your specific like use cases and what others maybe in your industry or geographic area are using as far as antivirus goes, because they're going to collect samples from uh, to get these signatures. So you want your system to be uh, or the antivirus to be uh, kind of in line with what people in your use case are also using. But that gets a little complicated. So if you just pick one, it should be fine. Uh, definitely keep your operating system and software up to date. Uh, let those updates happen at least, you know, by the end of the day, I realize that it gets annoying if it just starts restarting randomly, but try to make sure to keep all of your software and operating system up to date, including on your phones. Uh, when in doubt about a link, go to the website that supposedly goes to directly. So if you get an email from your bank and the link looks weird, just go to your bank website, uh, use strong passwords, which I actually have a segment talking about that more in depth. Uh, use MFA when available, uh, especially on accounts that are important to you like banks and you know email accounts too, because they can compromise a whole bunch of other accounts. Don't reuse passwords across multiple sites uh, 
and spring 2020 is not a good password, or I guess it would be summer 2020 now, but uh, that password scheme is used a lot uh, because you, a lot of systems make you change your password every 90 days. So that's the easiest scheme. Uh, your kids and pets names are not good. They can be found on social media and uh, long quotes from books and music lyrics can even be cracked. They'll put those into password cracking. Uh, password managers are good when used properly and they can, will automatically generate secure passwords for you and remember them. <clears throat> this is a uh, have I been pwned uh, dot com is a great resource. You can put your email address in there and it'll tell you how many data breaches your email address has been involved in. And uh, if you go on here every so often and you see a new data breach, uh, go change your password on the website that was breached for sure. Uh, because it may have been cracked. So email and message precautions. Uh, check the from. It should match or at least make sense based on the rest of the email, like who's sending it to you. Uh, definitely check for typos. Uh, typo squatting is a popular technique where you go and register a domain that is similar, kind of visually similar to the one that you're spoofing. So like Facebook with two Ks. Uh, a lot of companies have gone and tried to buy up as many of these domains as possible, but they slip through every once in a while. And definitely if, you know, saying it's from your bank and it's the reply to address or the from address is like Gmail, something's up. Uh, check the links in there. Make sure that if it displays the text for the link, it matches what you're actually clicking on. Uh, and make sure that where it points to is logical. Uh, some mar mass marketing use forwarding services, so it may be a little bit more difficult to determine if it's gonna where it's gonna go. Uh, but you'll sort of see the same few mass marketing, like one's Marketo, and you'll see like .mkto I think uh, in the domain. So you know those are somewhat legit, although you get spam a lot from stuff like that too. Uh, but usually not like phishing attacks. Uh, definitely check at the body, look for odd requests based on the content or bad grammar. Uh, odd requests would be like, can't think of an example, but you know, I mean, your bank's not going to ask you to like email a bunch of personal information directly back to them. So that's something that'd be suspicious. Or if it sounds like a little bit too dire of a thing, that's another thing they try to create a sense of urgency. So, you know, and you can always check with sender through other, other means or most of the time. So if it's something from your bank that sounds urgent, you can call up your bank or go to your bank and make sure it's legitimate or not. And also ask, is this an email I should expect to receive? Uh, or the sender, do I expect to receive emails from them? Have I received stuff from them in the past that was legitimate? Um, I, this is more of a phone call thing, but a common phone scam, um, especially with older people, is they call up saying they're from Microsoft Tech Support, which Microsoft's never going to call people like that unless you're like enterprise plan with dedicated tech support. And they say that there's a problem with their computer and then they get you to install a remote desktop to give them access to the computer. So stuff like that can also be uh, you know, on email. And uh, yeah, the, yeah, the suspicious call to action I already mentioned. Uh, if you're doing development, uh, I mean, this is MIS class, you'll do, I'm sure, some development. Uh, definitely use well supported and respected libraries as much as possible. Um, like the support definitely helps if there's a bug to get it fixed faster or even finding the bug faster because there's more people looking at it. Uh, know how to properly use the libraries and the best practices, especially with database libraries uh, or the libraries that connect you to a database uh, from the client side. There's a lot of best practices involved. Um, things like prepared statements for SQL will mitigate a lot of the security risks involved. Whereas if you just take user input and pipe it in to the database query, uh, it, it can cause problems and security uh, uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, the OWASP top 10 uh, is a great uh, list of the top security risks, uh, specifically to web 
apps, but they also have top 10 lists now for like IOT and I think other fields. So being familiar, if you're using doing web app development or IOT development with those top 10 lists uh, and how to mitigate those security risks is very important. And even if you are just making a site that's internal for the rest of your company, these uh, the security risks still are uh, relevant because all an attacker needs is one access point to your network and all of a sudden they have access to that website. And if that allows them to dump the uh, database that was supposed to be internal, then uh, you can have problems. Uh, wireless precautions. Uh, avoid connecting, well, this is specifically Wi-Fi. Wireless is like a very large spectrum of things, uh, but avoid connecting to open or unprotected networks. Uh, don't log into any of your accounts on open networks and especially not work accounts. Um, unless you use a VPN, which will encrypt the traffic from your computer all the way to the, at least the VPN server to make sure that it can't be, uh, you know, spoofed or man in the middle. Uh, on your home router, use WPA2, I should have put, with a strong password. Uh, disable WPS and update firmware. Uh, whenever, as like check for updates often because they will have vulnerabilities that they may patch. On your phones and devices, turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth when they're not in use. They'll those will leak information. Uh, they'll allow you to actually be physically tracked, and they'll just drain your battery too. And also, if you're out like in the middle of nowhere camping or something. Um, as far as battery drain goes and you're not getting a cell signal, if you put it in airplane mode, you can conserve your battery uh, greatly because it'll just drain trying to find the cell networks. Sort of a non-security tip on that. Uh, when you use a network once, like you go to a conference or you travel, use a hotel network. Uh, when you get back, you can go into your network settings and forget that network so that it won't try to connect to it because uh, people could try to spoof that network and then, uh, you know, man in the middle of your connection. Uh, on your corporate networks, uh, using WPA2 Enterprise, they will it'll pop up with this accept certificate thing if you haven't installed the certificate manually, and you should avoid using that if possible. Um, try to ask IT or look through like the IT wiki to find uh, a certificate that was issued like, or that is their official certificate for connecting to Wi-Fi, because that's how you know that you're connecting to an actual hot, uh, hotspot that is uh, controlled by the network. I mean, I could, so you could create like an WPA2 hotspot and it'll, with a certificate that's invalid. And if someone just clicks accept certificate, then they're on a, ro a rogue network. <clears throat> uh, so passwords. Uh, this is a old, when I was in college, I think this came out, uh, talking about, you know, the difference between like, uh, passwords that people try to make up. And then they came up with a scheme of four random common words saying that it was a uh, more easier to remember and more difficult to actually guess. Um, and a lot of people actually were doing this. I remember a lot of people uh, were sitting there trying to remember their four random words that were their password now. Uh, the problem with that, although they kind of accounted for it, is dictionaries. There's uh, all these words are known and easily looked up. And dictionary attacks are the preferred way of cracking most passwords these days. Um, also, one of the things in the comic is they were saying at 1,000 per second, uh, which may have been relevant at the time based on computing power, which I but I doubt it. But nowadays, uh, just with the commodity desktop, uh, depending on the algorithm, you could get over 100 million per second attempts, uh, which is a way more than 1,000. So that's instead of 550 years for their sample password, it's two days. And uh, for the example password that they said was like the Troubadour, um, unless they actually know what scheme you're using, technically that password had 72 bits of entropy instead of 28 uh, versus the 44, uh, because they would have to run through every single possible character combination to crack that password, unless they had some idea of how to uh, do the password scheme. So that would be 5.5 days now, 
or 150 billion years at their 1,000 guesses per second, which is a little bit better, but still not great. That's why, uh, but that was only 11 characters. So the entire English language, uh, they assumed, I think, 20, uh, 20, 2048 common words for their thing, uh, their uh, sample. Uh, the entire English language uh, would be 77 bits of entropy, which is a little bit better than uh, even the random first password. Uh, but all you have to do is add one additional character to the Troubadour password to get 79. Uh, but it's still not great. And, uh, but it's still better than four random lowercase words is I guess the point here. And even, you know, like quotes I mentioned, they'll, they'll run entire quotes, entire books, you know, sentence by sentence as like one block and that counts as one password guess. Uh, and yeah, so a lot of people started using that and it is not good these days. It may have been okay back then, but it's definitely not a good way to go given how password cracking runs these days. Uh, so better methods, uh, password manager is uh, one of the recommended ones, although you will have to create a secure, memorable password for that. Uh, but once you've done that, you can generate very long, random, high entropy passwords that will just be filled with a ton of random characters. You can do like 32 characters long and not going to crack that. And uh, some of the password managers actually will synchronize across your devices, which is helpful because you have a lot of devices you may need to sign in with. Um, Bruce Schneier, well known in security field, uh, came up with the idea of a passphrase, or at least is known for the passphrase idea. It may, have, may or may not have been the inventor. Uh, but basically, you take some sentence and you convert it into uh, symbols and or or in, based on words and or the first letter of a word. So his example is this little piggy went to market and they did TLP went, capital went to M. Uh, so you come up with some kind of scheme that's not really predictable to convert your pass, uh, a long phrase into a secure password. Although I'd suggest uh, special characters these days for sure. Uh, if you do feel like you gotta reuse some passwords or it makes it easier. I did see one time uh, a suggestion for like pseudo reuse of passwords and you create a very strong base password and just memorize it. And then you, based on what your context is of where you're signing up, you can uh, create like a, don't do something obvious, but you can create some sort of appended phrase or word that goes onto it to make it different from other websites. So if the password gets breached one place, it can't directly be used somewhere else. So an example here, uh, if you're creating a password for your bank and you use the uh, Schneier passphrase, we did TLP went to M and then put money with a zero and a three. Uh, so I mean, obviously don't use that exact money now, but you know, come up with something that's uh, relevant you know, if, if your bank's pissing you off, maybe it's some expl expletive to uh, uh, convey your uh, frustration with them, something like that. I don't know, but something that you'll remember, but isn't easily uh, guessed. And often overlooked when you're creating your passwords by both users and attackers, at least now, I'm sure attackers are getting onto it, is that spaces uh, may actually be supported, although not always but you can add spaces into your passwords on some places. And if, if you can't, it'll probably say it's invalid when you're creating it, but definitely that's something to try out and uh, can add some extra security. And use multi-factor authentication on important accounts. I mean, ideally all, but it is a pain. So you gotta sort of have your risk model. What, you know, what do you cannot be compromised and what do you not care about? Like, do you, if you don't care about your Reddit, Reddit account getting compromised, maybe don't use multi-factor, but email accounts would be good to have it because they are the keys to a lot of other accounts through uh, password resets. <clears throat> uh, so Wi-Fi, um, just getting it more in depth into there. Uh, open networks, uh, the traffic is not encrypted. You can uh, sniff the traffic. And the only thing that would be encrypted is if the communication itself is encrypted like HTTPS, uh, but otherwise uh, there's no encryption added because of 
through the wireless protocol itself. And uh, access points can easily be spoofed. All you have to do is say the name or start one up with the name and the uh, clients that are trying to connect to it or manually connect to it will connect. There are, uh, no, yeah, you can also uh, reduce or circumvent communication encryption like the HTTPS, although that's a harder one, but um, a lot of it sort of relies on uh, getting the user to do something, but you can put up an invalid certificate in between. And if they click through that invalid certificate to go to the website anyway, that's like a fake website, um, you can end up getting all their information or their, their traffic because you're the one actually starting that website or a man in the middle in it. Uh, also, some iPhones automatically will connect to ATT Wi-Fi uh, SSID, ESSID, which is just the network name. So that's a good thing to know. Um, you can disable that by turning off Wi-Fi calling in the settings. Uh, but that was an interesting, I don't know if all of, if current ones do, but definitely there was a time when models would automatically connect to ATT Wi-Fi to uh, help with their calling speed. And that is something that could be uh, leveraged by an attacker to get you to connect to their uh, rope station. <clears throat> uh, so this is a big old page of encryption terminology that's gonna be somewhat relevant. Uh, so a key is a secret used to encrypt data. Um, a pre-shared key is when uh, all clients are using the same key as well as the server and they all know the single key uh, or the, the ones that are supposed to have it. Uh, there's an initialization vector uh, is a value that's added to a key to extend its lifetime because when you encrypt with a key uh, too many times, you can actually, uh, if someone's lis uh, listening to that communication, they can actually uh, derive the key if it's been used to decrypt too much data. Specifically, I believe if it's been the same exact data and key have been used twice, it gets really easy to derive the key. <clears throat> That's sort of relevant to, I mean, it's a little more advanced of a concept, but it's relevant to one of the attacks that I'll talk about. A pseudo random number generator generates random numbers. Um, and these come in different varieties. And there's also cryptographic versus non cryptographic. So if you're doing, uh, you know, if you're just programming uh, in any language, uh, like uh, C sharp, Java, any language, they'll have a random number generator. Uh, but these are not cryptographic random numbers, and you can easily guess the random numbers after that. So in cryptography, it needs to be a cryptographic pseudo random number generator, which uh, has specific properties. Uh, symmetric encryption is uh, both sides use the same key for encryption and decryption. <clears throat> Asymmetric encryption, uh, you have two different keys. Uh, one's public and one's private, and uh, so and that leaves a public key encryption, which uses a pair of asymmetric key. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, and the asymmetric is you just have two different keys, and a public key is you have a public and a private key, and you can do some interesting things between those keys. Uh, most of the time, this sort of encryption is used to negotiate, like identify yourself and negotiate a symmetric encryption key because uh, you don't want to keep reusing the same public key or private key over and over again, or else it'll uh, become less secure. Hash function is a cryptographic function that is one way. Basically, it encrypts something in a way that you cannot reverse it. Um, and the, any, and it specifically, it has a specific size on the output. Uh, regardless of the input size. So it could be anywhere from one character to like millions of characters. You're gonna have the exact same output size. <clears throat> uh, handshake is a sequence of steps prior to establishing communication. Uh, they, they go back and client and server go back and forth uh, in a specific way based on what the protocol is. And assault is a specific value that you add to a key or often passwords. Uh, to prevent certain attacks. It's just, it's very heavily used and re uh, recommended for uh, if you're storing user passwords in a database, which should be hashed. Um, you add a salt. Uh, every user has a different salt that's stored along with it, and you add that to their password. 
so it makes it harder to uh, crack the passwords if the data gets leaked. Because if you didn't add that salt, um, the, the way that you counter hash functions is you can uh, try a bunch of things out. And if you end up with the same hash function for an input, then you know that that input was the same. So salt helps prevent you from having a list of passwords already made up that you can just check it against. Uh, so the first encrypted uh, encryption offered to uh, wireless or Wi-Fi was uh, wired equivalent pro privacy, WEP. Uh, it's not used very much these days and should not be used, but um, they used a pre-shared key and uh, but the encryption RC4 was not particularly well implemented and there actually are a couple uh, issues with RC4 itself, but uh, their implementation specifically was not good. Uh, RC4 was not intended for using the same key over a long duration. Um, more, I mean, all cryptography is like that, but RC4 more than others, and they would they would use the key to encrypt all their uh, traffic, and they use an initialization initialization vector along with that key to sort of help extend key use. But their initialization vector was susceptible to statistical attacks, specifically 9,000 of the 16 million. Uh, IVs were considered weak. So if you connect enough or collect enough of those IVs, uh, you can actually get the key. Uh, it's not deterministic. So it's not going to be like if you get a thousand of them, you always get the key, but uh, it, it'll vary how many you need, but you, you can keep trying. The little screenshot at the bottom uh, is from Aircrack. Uh, there's a way to uh, take whatever data you have and try to get the key and it'll just keep trying or you, until it's found. Uh, there's 40 bit or 104 bit uh, pre shared key, and then there's always a 24 bit IV. And uh, instead of using it, use WPA2 with a strong pre shared key or radius, which I'll talk about those later. Uh, there's also very interesting, this is why you shouldn't really use WEP at all. Um, that's called the Cafe Latte attack. And it is an attack against WEP, but specifically, it's an attack against a client who has connected to a web access point. And um, so when you have access points that you've connected to, uh, they will beacon out trying to find those access points. And you can, there's a, a method for telling that client, hey, I'm this web access point. And then you can uh, send a bunch of packets to it, uh, specific, specially crafted packets. And within six minutes or so, or as they put the amount of time it takes to drink a cafe latte, uh, you can actually get the web key from the client with the, without the actual access point being anywhere around. <clears throat> so Wi-Fi protected access, WPA, and now there's WPA2, which is the recommended of the two. There actually was a WPA3, but there was a lot of problems with it. So they're not sure if that one's gonna get <laughs> actually implemented or not, or reworked. Uh, there's multiple modes. Uh, Pre-shared keys is one of them and the more popular one. Uh, WPA2 versus WPA, uh, there's authentication. So that's why it's a little, why it's better to use WPA2. Um, the pre-shared key is possible to be cracked. Uh, if you can capture the handshake, which happens when uh, you first connect to a network uh, and you use a dictionary attack against that. That's why those, uh, the password tips and strong passwords are important even on your Wi-Fi network. I believe I read somewhere that if it's over 23 characters, it's not supposed to be crackable, uh, but I haven't confirmed whether that's specific, a specific case or if that's just sort of theoretical. <clears throat> uh, and then yeah, the strength of your pre-shared key will affect your success in the cracking. So that's why you wanna use a good pre-shared key. And then there's radius, which is also called uh, enterprise, uh, and it can't be direct, cracked directly, um, but they can compromise the radius server itself via other means, and you can create an uh, invalid or fake certificate uh, on your fake access point, and if they click accept certificate, uh, they'll be connected to you. And also, uh, Radius generally uses uh, user credentials within the system, so Radius is probably what uh, I imagine SHJSU is using where you log in with your student ID and password. Uh, so if that gets leaked somewhere, they could use it to connect as you. And ideally, 
you should these should be set up to have signs like officially signed certificates uh, on both the client and the server side, and these these certificates should be distributed to people prior to them even trying to connect. Uh, but it all it makes it a lot more difficult to maintain because you have to issue all these certificates to people. Uh, Wi-Fi protected setup is a feature that was uh, created to make it easier to connect to these networks because you know trying to remember a 16 plus digit key was hard for people to do so they created a few ways to make it a little bit easier. Uh, one of them was an eight digit pin that would be a uh, set uh, hard or usually printed on the uh, device the router. Uh, some of them will allow you to change that eight digit pin and actually if you're going to use that uh, but it's actually not really a secure thing because you can crack it in a matter of hours via brute force attack and certain chipsets that doesn't even have to be done against the uh, the device itself they can just uh, capture data and then go crack it offline uh, then they came out with the push button I'm sure you've seen that little uh, kind of recycle looking logo or uh, that you push it and it gives you maybe a minute or two to connect your device. Uh, the, and that's more secure uh, than the pin method, but the problem is the pin is usually still enabled, even if there is the push button. And often you can't actually disable them individually. And actually some routers, even if it, you disable WPS, sometimes it's not really disabled. So that's another thing to look into and keep the firmware up to date. Uh, and also physical for even the the push button method uh, if someone has physical access to your router they can just push the button uh, so at minimum you should disable the pin method but ideally just disable wps because it's a uh, not very secure in general so this uh this is basically why this is relevant or one of one of the reasons why this is relevant uh so the evil twin you can if you if you can crack someone's passphrase or the pre-shared key, or there is no pre-shared key, you can create your own access point with the name, same name that they're looking for, and they'll connect to you and you can man in the middle the traffic. And this can be done sometimes, even if the legitimate access point is around, uh, it just has a matter of having a better signal strength as far as the client's concerned. Um, uh, another, tactic, a uh, little less sophisticated, but can easily equally be useful. Uh, I'm sure you've seen these when you connect to a network, like at a hotel or something, you need to give some information or sign up or accept terms. Uh, if you create a, or someone with a rogue access point could easily just pop up their own page that says, hey, uh, you know, give us this information. And then, you know, if it's a attacker, then they've got your information now. Or you could have like, they could have a login page and uh, maybe someone logs in with their password or cr creates an account with their password that they've used somewhere else. So, uh, also going back to password, password reuse. Uh, security tips for Wi-Fi in general, uh, use WPA with a good long password. Disable WPS, at least pin mode. Uh, change the name of your access point, uh, the network name when you set it up. Uh, uh, this, this goes back to the salts, so uh, the password or the pre-shared keys in WPA are salted with the name of the network. And there's a lot of very common network names and you can download these, they call them rainbow tables. And they have basically for the top 2000 uh, most common network names, they've gone and pre-hashed all of the passwords. So it literally takes uh, less than a second to crack a password if, if the network name is on there and you have the right rainbow table. Uh, instead of having to do it manually with a dictionary attack. <clears throat> or a lot of, I don't know if anyone's noticed, uh, like at and is notorious for this. Uh, when it comes set up with a uh, password uh, on the back, it's always just a bunch of numbers. Definitely not a secure thing to do and something that people will try. And it doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, when you get into the UI for your uh, router, uh, change the admin password and maybe even change uh, the admin account name or delete the admin account and create your own admin account under a different name because uh, there's a lot of attacks where they will try to use default uh, credentials 
or in default usernames to try to access your device uh, via the internet. Um, turn off your phone Wi-Fi I mentioned and Bluetooth when they're not in use because they will leak information. And uh, Apple's probably fixed this by now, but there was actually a thing with Bluetooth where it was leaking a ton of information about you uh, as part of their ability to like send information to apps and devices. Um, and you can actually be physically tracked using these. There's a little picture of the fox with the rifle. Uh, it's called fox hunting, uh, which refers to tracking down the source of a radio signal. And uh, it's, I mean, it's a little bit of an art, a little bit of science, but um, you actually can use signal strengths and a little bit of reasoning to try to figure out where the source of the signal is. Uh, this is one of the things that happen that we do at the wireless CTF and also one of the reasons we've been successful were successful those two times is uh, we were very good at the fox hunting which was worth lots of points um, it also drains your battery I mentioned uh, and you use a VPN uh, on public net or especially on public networks uh, but even on pre-shared keys because uh, you know if you go into a place that has like a pre-shared key like coffee shop, local coffee shop or like a bar or something and they're like oh here's our password well anyone in there knows that password too and they could create their own access point with that password that's uh not valid without even having to crack that password so vpn is just a good idea if you're connecting to any untrusted uh public network regardless of the strength it has uh opsec and physical security uh, this, I'm going to run through this pretty quick. It's uh, in the available in the video from the last talk, but uh, break down some of the key points from it. Uh, reconnaissance is the first step in any attack uh, that's collecting information. Uh, anything you make available could be used against you, and there is a lot of data available from breaches, uh, and they, that's something you can't really control except for like limiting what you what data you put out there. Uh, but that also can be used. Uh, in various ways, including password cracking. If they know like family members' names, they might try those as your password. Uh, other data can come from social media, uh, which you can control. Specifically, who's your employer, job title, connections and friends, location data, and even photos. Uh, they can all leak data, and that's something you can directly control. And you can also set who has access to it. And Data posted by or about a company can also be useful to attackers. So if you're in charge of posting such data, be careful. Uh, employees, contracted services, suppliers, and the like uh, all can give an attacker an edge when they're doing the reconnaissance phase on a company. Uh, so your keys, like your actual like house, car, house and car keys and ID badges, uh, don't post any photos with your keys or badges in them, both of which can be uh, from the photo uh, duplicated or for the ID badge, you know, someone could create a brand new ID badge that looks the same to get into uh, wherever it is that badge goes into. Uh, but with keys, it, it's completely possible to take even a not very good photo of a key and duplicate the key from the photo. Uh, don't wear them in public. Someone else could snap a photo real quick. And especially with the badges, if it's a RFID access badge, they can clone them. Uh, don't leave them lying around for the same reason. Uh, if wearing it is a requirement uh, and you see someone not wearing it, uh, your badge specifically, uh, ask, ask to see it. It's not rude. I mean, it, it should be like sort of that's part of like a security culture is, you know, everyone sort of does their part. If something looks off, they uh, they ask. And also, like, you know, if someone's trying to tailgate you, like, go, you use your key card to get into an area and they're going to go through. It's, I wouldn't consider it rude to ask them, hey, could you just badge in yourself too to confirm that your badge is the right one? Uh, unless you know that person, you know, specifically has access to that area anyway. I mean, it depends on the size of the company, but if they, you don't know them entirely or at all, then definitely. Uh, and your home has locks on them for a reason, so please use them. I've heard too many stories of people like, oh yeah, I don't even lock my, lock my house. It's such a safe neighborhood. Uh, but you know, all it takes is one person going around testing doors out and you could get robbed or worse. Uh, if you do buy an RFID blocker for your 
key cards or your passport or your uh, chip bank chip cards, uh, make sure you test them out because uh, some of them do not work and some of them do. The easy way to test it out, like if it's your bank card, just slip it in and go try to use the, uh, the touch pay and it should not work. Um, passports are a little bit harder, although you can try out a different card maybe, uh, like your bank card, just to verify that it is blocking some radio signal. Uh, same with the, your, your badge, your uh, work badge. Uh, you can slide it in there, try to use it on a door and it shouldn't work. Uh, don't just, like I mentioned, tailgating. Uh, oftentimes they don't even need to go, attackers won't even need to go through the uh, steps of like trying to clone a badge. Uh, they'll just, someone will let them in being a nice person. Um, uh, that's also where the, uh, not using the visual appearance of your badges come in. So someone could have, even, even if you have a badge that's RFID for the doors and a little sticker with the name and picture, uh, someone could just come out with the badge with just the name and sticker and there's no RFID information and then they're wearing that. They look legitimate. Someone lets them in. Uh, social media. Uh, don't add locations to your posts or photos uh, or at least while you're at that location because it's just advertising, hey, I'm not home or hey, I'm here. Uh, you know, maybe if you're on vacation wait and post those photos afterwards and tag the location like hey you know i just came back from here so you know you're not letting people know that your house is uh, abandoned what for a week or two uh look into the privacy settings there's a lot of them uh, explore them change them don't make anything fully public uh but even like friends of friends it's not too hard to become friends with a, a friend of someone usually um so even that can leak information, so be careful. Uh, definitely don't accept everyone, every request you get. And that sort of goes into that friends of friends things because there will be people that will just accept any request they get. So if you're being targeted by someone for information, all they need to do is find your friend that accepts every friend request that they get and that's their end for the friends of friends. Uh, don't share personal information or sensitive information about your work on social media. Uh, avoid using the those single sign-ons where you use your Google or Facebook account to log into a different website because uh, they can, if there's a data breach or your, you know, your credentials get stolen, then they have access to all those other sites. But at the same time, if those sites get compromised, they may be able to compromise your uh, Google or Facebook credentials too. It's, you, they always give you a way to just sign up with an email and password. So just do that. And onto emails definitely have at least a couple of emails for different purposes. Um, you know, so like if, if you got your banking account, use a, a more a different email address to that than you do for just like your fun, like social media, Reddit, stuff like that. Uh, because if your email account gets compromised, they can compromise uh, any account associated with that email, unless you have really good MFA set up. But oftentimes, even if you have MFA, it's good. The other factor is your email account and they can do uh, password resets as well. <clears throat> and also beyond just security on social media, employers or potential employers will look at what you post. Um, people have gotten in trouble for what they posted. They have not gotten jobs for things that they posted. So you know, just sort of be aware of that. Uh, this is because I mentioned like the location uh, this is just sort of an example on Android and iPhone, how to turn off the location for your, uh, your photos. Uh, it actually will embed the location into your photos if the location's turned on for it. And then it, if you post it to certain websites that don't sanitize that, uh, the actual geolocation of where the photo was taken will be associated. So if you take a picture of you and holding your key up for your brand new house with location on, uh, then copy that key and know exactly where your house is to come rob you. So it's definitely a relevant and security risk. And that was it. So questions and answers. That was a very comprehensive and a nice presentation. Thank you, uh, Jonathan.
uh, hey guys, uh, if you have questions, uh, post them on the chat window and I'll read it out. Uh, and while you're doing that, I actually have a few questions. Uh, uh, how do you feel about uh, the no password approach that a lot of companies are trying, uh, wherein uh, there's absolutely uh, no password? They're using a combination of cell phones and and uh, uh, you know uh, prompts uh, to determine that that is you. Actually, I'm glad you asked that because <laughs> I do have opinions on that. Um, like, there's a huge problems with passwords, um, but part of the theory on like effective multi-factor authentication is you should have something you have and something you know. And even if you have a bad password, it's still something you know that uh, someone can't just pick up. Uh, so I do think that in a proper multi-factor authentication scheme and making sure people have at least decent passwords, uh, they are still useful. And like a lot of them are going for uh, the whole biometrics thing is like another like something you have and something you are uh, is becoming popular is the two factors. Um, but the, the one problem I see with uh, biometrics in general, but especially over like a password is uh, you can't change your biometrics. Someone gets your face or a way to, you know, mimic your face or your fingerprint or whatever biometric data they're using. Uh, you can't change that. You can't revoke that. Uh, so I, I don't see biometrics as like the answer. So I think there is a place for passwords, just, but not as like the sole source of uh, securing something. Right. And, you know, the other kind that I was uh, wondering is like, you know, for example, if I want to enter uh, my Microsoft account, uh, it will send a message to my phone asking me that, you know, hey, are you trying to log in? And if I say yes, it basically logs me in. No password required, no nothing required. Uh, I've kind of like, you know, if they say that it is more secure, I'm kind of like always a little hesitant uh, doing it that way. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's more secure, it's definitely easier. Uh, it has some secure security benefits, but if someone gets your phone, then, uh, you know, they have access to all of that. Um, right. I would imagine there are ways that they can get around that too. Uh, I know there's, I don't, I haven't heard of it used specifically for something like that, but there is the SIM swapping attack where you, uh, people, attackers will go in uh, to a uh, mobile carrier and they'll pretend to be someone and be like, hey, uh, you know, I, I need a new SIM card and they will get a SIM card for your account and then uh, be able to hijack your account and even if you're using like text message MFA, they can get all your text messages. So there's a lot they can do there. I don't think that would work for that sort of thing because it's tied to the device, not the SIM card, uh, but you never know. Oh, uh, I'm sorry if I missed it, but uh, did you talk about social engineering? I mean, that is a big uh, part of, uh, you know, uh, this technology. Uh, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I didn't talk about that. Uh, like I sort of alluded to it, but I didn't mention that specifically. Uh, it, so you talk about prevention, uh, technical prevention and physical prevention. Uh, do you have any opinions about uh, social engineering? How to uh, you know, prevent becoming a victim of social engineering? Um, yeah, I mean, so like the, the phishing stuff is generally social engineering to like click this link uh, send us this information, but they're also, you know, you'll get in real life, you'll get phone calls or in person. A lot of the social engineering comes down to uh, uh, obtaining information or getting you to do something. Uh, so just sort of being aware, like, don't volunteer information and especially like know what information you're okay to give and not um, is definitely important for avoiding that sort of social engineering. Uh, I have another question. How much should an average person be really concerned about uh, these security issues? Because, uh, I mean, the general belief uh, that most people hold is, hey, uh, I'm not important enough that somebody will target me. Or, uh, uh, you know, because it, there's always a trade-off, a trade-off between convenience and security, right? So an, an average person like, you know, uh, me or, you know, uh, how much should we be concerned about 
security. I mean, we should take basic precautions, but should we go out of the way of uh, forgetting the network the moment we step out of the hotel or, uh, you know, how much of that is important? Um, so a lot of, like, I'd say a lot of that, um, I mean, yeah, the forgetting the network is maybe a little on the side of the paranoid, but at the same time, they don't necessarily have to be targeting you. Um, because I mean, the, the thing with the forget network is your device will sit there and beacon trying to connect to that network. So, I mean, someone could set up, go to a copy shop, set up their computer to basically just any any network that gets, and actually I think the pineapple, Wi-Fi Pineapple does this, uh, which was in one of the pictures. I don't know if you had everyone watch Silicon Valley again, but there was an episode with the Wi-Fi Pineapple. Uh, there is a, a feature on the Wi-Fi Pineapple, I believe, where if any network that uh, a device beacons out for, it'll just create that network uh, on the fly and then start serving, uh, I believe, the one of those login pages. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like how important you are so much as uh, how risky are the places you're going or is there someone there just trying to, you know, hack people. Uh, awesome. All right, <laughs> makes sense. Uh, you mentioned Silicon Valley. I do give that as an assignment. How do you feel about that assignment? I mean, do you think that's a? Uh, I think that Silicon Valley is a good reflection of what is happening, uh, uh, maybe in a slightly comedic way. Yeah, it is definitely. That's a great show. Um, I love that show. Uh, it definitely satires, you know, some of the what you could see as problems with the tech industry, like. The, like every every single company, like I'm trying to make the world a better place through a fast message bus peer thing. Like they all think that they're like helping when really, you know, they're just trying to make money like any other company. But yeah, it's a, it's a good show. There's a lot, a lot of stuff on there. Is, uh, I would say is accurate, including the satire. Nice. Uh, another, another good show specifically for security uh, that's very accurate is Mr. Robot. Oh, Mr. Robot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have a few student questions. Uh, do companies have to pay extra charges for WPA2 certification? Um, they don't have to. Uh, it, I think for if you're doing best practices, I think you it's suggested that you go out and pay for a uh, signed certificate from an official authority. Uh, but it's perfectly possible to create your own in-house certificate and or even your own certificate authority and make sure that those are provided to all of the users um, and it, it doesn't require paying anything other than like whoever's time it was to create that certificate, which is, it? I don't know, 10 minutes tops. Uh, Marlene has a question and actually I wondered this question too. So. Normally, if you're creating an account on a website, it gives you a couple of options. So for example, you can use your Google information, you can use your uh, Facebook information or uh, Amazon information to sign in, or you can create a new account using your email address. Like, you know, uh, is one preferred over the other? Uh, are there any downsides of using your uh, Google or your Facebook as a single sign-on uh, using their credentials to log onto the websites? Or should you always create a a, a fresh username and a password for every website. I would definitely recommend uh, using the fresh. I think I went over that real quick. Like uh, definitely I would recommend using a, your email pass, creating a new thing, a new account instead of using the single sign on uh, because it's giving whatever that website is access to your Google or Facebook or Microsoft, whichever account. And also, um, you know, if there's a data leak on any any side of there, it uh, just makes it a much larger problem for you. Uh, but it also, like, if their website gets compromised and suddenly they have access to their the accounts of the users through those tokens, uh, they can start getting into your Gmail account for things. And depending on how it's configured, get access to uh, not necessarily your email, but you know, information that's stored on there about you. Uh, uh, Apple has a feature. Uh, this question is by Dylan. Apple has a feature where they can create very long, crazy looking passwords for you and save it. 
I don't know how safe it is to have another company just to make my password for me. Uh, how do you feel about the security of this? And I guess the follow up is that, you know, they, they not only recommend your password, but they save it also. Um, that's, uh, it depends how they're doing it, uh, but I would hope it's secure. That's actually how the password managers typically work though. Uh, so that if they're doing it right, that's a perfectly acceptable practice. Um, I mean, the, the difference between that and like some, some of the password managers out there is uh, you'll have to fire up the password manager and copy and paste the password into where you're using it. Um, but like the Chrome, Chrome offers to save your passwords as well. And uh, it that used to be insecure, uh, but they actually uh, upped the security on it on depending on what device and how it's set up. Um, I mean, I use Chrome to save passwords for a lot of things. Uh, it it has a lot to do with gaining access to the manager or not. So the if if they can compromise your device or your uh, your computer running Chrome, uh, an attacker may get access to those passwords. Uh, but that's def but that also applies kind of to the password manager as well. So it's definitely a, a good way to, or a better way to go than like insecure passwords. So I'm a big fan of password managers, but at the same time, I've also heard concerns that, you know, hey, you've created a hotspot where all your passwords are there. If there's a leak at the password manager level, then literally your entire life uh, will be online. Everything will be online. Uh, how do you feel about the password managers? Um, I think it's, I mean, I still think it's definitely a good way to go. You just have to have extra security precautions regarding those managers. Um, I, I believe it's, this would probably be a little more advanced, uh, but I believe it's possible to even to set them up so they're running off like maybe a USB drive so you can unplug and plug them in as as needed so it's not always available uh, which would be a security precaution and also help with portability um, but password managers are pretty well regarded in the security community if if they're if they're done right and a good manager that's you know known for a good track record with security because you can create some completely uncrackable passwords in them it's also possible to just run multiple uh, accounts or multiple instances, and you could have, uh, you know, seg segment your passwords the same way you might segment uh, your email addresses. So you have like one stores your very important ones, and maybe that one is uh, on an external device that you can unplug and plug in. Whereas like all your daily general use passwords, maybe you just leave synchronized in your uh, on your iPhone or in Chrome or on like your built in password or installed password manager. You know, this is a question that was asked uh, in your last presentation also. And uh, it always cracks me up. Uh, do you feel safe when attending these hackers conferences? How do you protect your data knowing that you are in the middle of uh, hackers and you know, uh, um, uh, just about everyone can get into your uh, phones or your computers. Um, yeah, I well, I, at CEFCON specifically, I feel definitely safe, but that's because uh, of the precautions I take. Uh, I use uh, I have burner phones that are only used at the conference, and uh, a laptop that I only use for the conference or like you know if I'm doing the wireless CTF related stuff, and I won't connect those to any of my actual accounts. Uh, so that's, but that's precautions I've taken. Those may be overkill as well. I mean, DEF CON does try to provide good levels of security um, against, you know, things going on. Uh, but I mean, there's there's lesser precautions that I take at like uh, B-Sides events that are still would probably get you through DEF CON just fine, which is you just turn off, uh, turn off, disable all your accounts for email and especially corporate email, uh, don't let them synchronize, don't check them, uh, let people know that the, you know they have to call you be via phone if they really need to get a hold of you, and don't bring like your official work laptop or something, or at least don't bring it to the conference area. And that that works for a lot of people, and that's usually what I do if I'm uh, attending a smaller conference. Nice. A lot of it 
down to like, especially this also goes back to like the wireless networks, you know, if you're connecting to the DEF CON's wireless networks or the casino's wireless networks or wherever, and you, that's where the attackers are going to live and try to man in the middle of your stuff. So, uh, and that's, if you turn off your account sync on your phone, it's not going to try to send credentials to, for your email to the, over those networks. And you can also use VPNs as well uh, is another good thing to use. Nice. Uh, you Part of this question you've already answered. Uh, you know, the question is outside of say browser Chrome or something, where else do you recommend to save the password? Have it written down on paper on a document? Uh, you know, the, the funny thing is the other day when I went to Staples, they were actually selling a small notebook which had username, which had uh, you know a column for website, username, and password. In other words, they are actually selling a booklet and want you to write down username and password. Uh, I don't know if it is old fashioned. I don't know why they are still selling it, but I saw it, and you know apparently it's one of the popular products. Yeah, that's a uh, still unfortunately pretty common. I, so I suppose something like that, like it's not recommended, especially not like the post-it notes on the bottom of your mouse. Uh, this comes from like the physical security stuff. So it's a little bit less likely than certain other security things. But, you know, if you've got someone trying to break into your building, whether they're a pen tester or a legitimate uh, attacker, they're going to be checking underneath keyboards and drawers, stuff like that, looking for passwords. Uh, so, you know, definitely not that's not a suggested practice to like write them down um, or even like text files on your computer, you know, if it gets leaked or you you get malware, uh, suddenly all your passwords are gone. Whereas the password manager, if you get malware, there's some additional protection on there. Uh, granted, they still might be able to gain access to your password manager eventually, but it's there's a little bit added protection. Uh, the password books, yeah, that's funny. Like, I suppose something like that would be more secure if you locked it up when it was not in use in like a safe or a lockbox. Uh, but then that comes sort of back to, can they get into your safe or lockbox or just take it with them? Um, you familiar with a program called as Lightbeam, which actually shows uh, how the websites share information uh, share cookies and share information between uh, different data brokers? Uh, not actually. No. So anyways, there's a software, there's an extension on Firefox, which I demoed to the class, uh, just to show them that, you know, how data brokers exchange information uh, with each other on your browsing habits and browsing patterns. So the question is related to that. Uh, it says most, most websites are linked and sharing information with other websites. I mean, literally we saw 10 websites and they were all connected uh, through some data broker or the other. So the question is, are there security issues that can arise with all these companies sharing information? Is there a way we can minimize the amount of information being shared? Um, yeah, there's definitely security issues there. Cause I mean, uh, that would come down to like the more paranoid being targeted thing probably because you know, your personal information is going to be more useful to someone actually targeting you as far as security goes. I mean, privacy is a whole other story, though. Like, um, I don't know how to minimize really, other than, uh, I mean, using something like that before you sign up with your information to, or having like finding sites that sort of monitor how much information is being shared. Then, uh, like, not signing up for the sites or using, you could always use fake information, new create a new email account, um, depending on the site as well, uh, which is a way you could mitigate uh, sort of what, it will not necessarily how much information of yours is being shared, but you know, putting more or false information out there so that it doesn't correlate back to you as easily. I have one last question, uh, actually, Sorry, there was another question that come, came up. Uh, uh, what makes someone more of a target? Uh, is it their job position, location, wealth, popularity? Uh, 
even for ransomware, uh, I guess. What is it that attracts a uh, hacker into the lives? Is it the money? Is it the position of the person? Where they live? How popular they are? Um, yeah, I guess it depends on the motive, really. Uh, so, I mean, if their motive is money, they're going to go after, if, if they're going to target anyone, uh, I mean, the majority of like, you know, ransomware, malware scams out there don't target anyone. They just sort of find these email lists and just blast out as many emails as possible, hoping someone replies to them. Uh, but if they are going to go to the trouble of targeting someone, it's going to be who has access to the money. So often, like there's what's called business email compromise, and uh, they will target generally the financial department and pretend to be like the CFO or the CEO uh, saying that they need this wire transfer done immediately, you know, their vendor is pissed sort of thing. And uh, so they're, t they're targeting who has access to the money, not necessarily, and like the social, there's social engineering involved. So it's not necessarily the one who's has, is able to make the decision ultimately ideally on the money like this the cfo should be the one who's like yes pay that or don't pay that but you know if you get an angry email from your cf or supposedly from your cfo and it's not saying hey i need this transferred immediately you know you might do it without checking back in person or through other means so it's it, if for targeted attacks it's definitely going to be who who is best po positioned to meet the objective uh, so this will be the last question, I promise. Uh, the question is, how do you prepare for unexpected events? Like one thing that COVID has shown me is that uh, sometimes things happen really fast. And since your entire life is online, including banking and everything, uh, how do you pass on that information uh, to your near and dear ones? Uh, in case something unexpected happens. Because the more secure you become, the more difficult it becomes for your, uh, uh, for your loved ones to get that information or get into your accounts, right? But the life has to continue. And uh, I'm seeing that you know, a lot of people do not have, get enough time uh, to prepare uh, for it. So it looks like there's a, there's a, uh, a contradiction over here. More secure you become, more difficult it becomes to pass on the information to the loved ones. Yeah, that's actually uh, <laughs> uh, like my mom died a few months ago, and that actually sort of is rele very relevant right now. Like, she look luckily for me, I guess, was the type of person that wrote down every password in a book or post its. So I got this giant stack of potential passwords going. But definitely, like the more secure security measures you use, uh, it would be more difficult. I don't know that I'd like formulated a specific way for passing that information without compromising security. Um, I mean, I suppose you could have like in a safe somewhere, like here's here's uh, the password to my password manager. Uh, certainly, all your phone nowadays allows you access to a lot of different accounts, whether and shared password or save passwords, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, because you can do an account reset just by having the device or whatnot. So I guess at minimum, make sure that people have, uh, know someone you trust knows how to get into your device uh, would be a good recommendation. Um, also, there's, I mean, it's, it's a lot bigger of a pain to do, but uh, you know, in the event of someone's death, there's pretty much everything could be remedied through means other than having their password. Like you can go to their banks uh, in person with the death certificate and get everything transferred to your name. Uh, I'm sure there's, if you get onto tech support for whatever websites it is, if you need to stop a payment or something, uh, I'm sure there's ways that you can say, hey, this person is no longer with us. Um, you know, we need to either cancel the account or transfer it into someone else's name. Uh, so, I, like, I realize that's a lot of extra work, but it it definitely, I would think, would be possible for any account that uh, needs to be uh, transferred. 
All right, thank you so much. Those are all the questions that we had. Uh, that was a very, very thoughtful and a very, very insightful presentation, uh, as always. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm gonna unmute everyone uh, in case they want to share. You guys can uh, unmute and you know let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm going to end this meeting now.